Hey everyone, it's Kenji, and we're going to make some pasta primavera. My hands off first. All right. So, pasta primavera. Um, this is a actually relatively modern pasta dish. I think the history around 50, 6 years old. Invented in New York City um, uh, by I don't remember famous Italian restaurateur around around then. Um, my version is a little bit different from the original one. So the original one uses tomatoes and um, has, requires like six or eight different pans and has all these different preparations um, and is actually not, I don't think, particularly springy. Um, so mine is one that really uses a lot of spring vegetables and really focuses on that springy aspect um, and also that um, is sort of streamlined. So all it's going to take is one pan on the side and a pot of water for your vegetables and your pasta. So the first thing we're doing, I got this... Um, pan here, I'm going to melt a little butter in it, and I'm going to throw in some pine nuts and a few cloves of garlic that I'm just going to roughly sort of smash and chop up. So take the, take the tops off, smash, smash, smash. You can use a garlic press if you want, or you can sort of rub it on a microplane if you prefer. Um, I, I like the sort of smash and chop technique. Um, you can get it, you know, the, the finer you get it, the faster it's going to brown and the more sort of strong, pungent its flavor is going to be. Um, so I do it sort of medium, a medium fine chop. Enough to get garlic flavor in there but not sort of overwhelm. All right, and so we want this to go actually nice and slow. So I'm going to turn this down to basically the lowest possible heat. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to slowly extract flavor from the garlic um, without browning it. We're not looking for really brown garlic, uh, just sort of a uh, little bit of garlic, mellow garlic flavor in there. Um, and then it's also going to toast those pine nuts in the butter, in the butter, so it's going to bring make their flavor nice and toasty and bring it out into the sauce. All right, so now i got some water boiling here. I'm going to add salt. Quite a bit. Um, not as salty as ocean water. You know, a lot of people will tell you um, salted, make it as salty as the sea. Um, if you make your pasta water or your blanching water as salty as the sea, it is overwhelmingly salty. Uh, my, my colleague over at Series Heats, Daniel Gritzer, um, did a bunch of tests on this. Um, I think seawater is like something like 6% salt, very salty. Um, and he found you don't want it as salty as the sea, you just want it as salty as like tears. That's what, that's what you're looking for. Um, all right, and so now we're gonna prep our spring vegetables. I already started on these because I did it before I decided to turn on the camera. Um, but we got a bunch of spring vegetables here from the farmer's market. So these are English peas, um, and I'll just show you how to prep each one of these real quick. English peas are relatively easy. So what I'm doing is I take the top, the side with the, um, the stem on it, I kind of break it like that with my fingertip, and then I pull it down. And that's usually, usually all you need to do, and it'll pull these strings off the sides like that, and then it, the pod just kind of splits open. All right, and then you can roll the peas out with your thumb, just like that. Um, you can, of course, use frozen peas. Like, frozen peas are actually pretty great, but right now, peas are in season, sort of approaching the end of the season, so I like to use them fresh. Just like that. All right. And so we're going to actually blanch our vegetables in the same water that we're doing the pasta in. And we're going to blanch them virtually at the same time as the pasta. All right, so there's our peas. The next one, these are fava beans. Um, so fava beans are kind of a pain in the butt um, because you got to peel them twice. I'll show you. The first one is very similar to the peas. You break off the top, and that makes it relatively easy to open up the side of the pod like that. Actually, this one's giving me a little trouble. But usually they'll pop right open, and then you can pop the peas out like the, uh, the beans out like this. Oops, you can drop on the floor, pop the beans out. So what makes fava beans kind of a pain in the butt is that um, you have to peel them twice. You have to get them out of the, first you gotta shell them and get them out of the pod. Uh, that, this one's an easy one. Then after you blanch them, you gotta peel each individual bean. Um, so I don't know, people who work prep cooks at restaurants dislike fava beans um, because they take so much work to do. Um, we, we used to have a prep cook at one of the restaurants I worked at, um, Felipe, well, this was at Clio in Boston, um, and he was a pea and fava bean machine, because we used to serve an English pea soup there, and, you know, a bowl of soup would take, like, 
four times that, that amount of peas because it's basically just a you know pea puree. Um, and what, what would take me like probably 10 minutes to peel, you know, 10 minutes to peel enough peas to make a bowl of pea soup, he would do in like, you know, two minutes or less. Um, and he was really great at fava beans also. But that's what you get it for if you do this day in, day out for, um, you know, every, every uh, spring for years. <clears throat> so fava beans, um, you can, some people recommend peeling them before you blanch them. I, I actually find the flavor and color is better if you blanch them in the shell. Um, so just boiling water, boiling, boiling salted water, you blanch them in the shell and then you peel them after you've blanched them. Um, not only that, it also makes peeling them actually much easier because the skins will loosen up. So that's going to go in for about a minute. Now we're going to do asparagus. This is just some purple asparagus, not significantly, not significantly different flavor from green asparagus. It just looks nice. Um, a lot of people will recommend you break off the bottom of the asparagus like that, and they'll say that it just naturally breaks where it's supposed to. You know, the very bottom of the asparagus can be kind of woody. Um, this isn't really true um, because, you know, by applying force in different places, you can break it off virtually where you want it, wherever you want it. Um, but this is still a relatively easy way to peel asparagus. If I've got a ton, I'll just cut it off with a knife, you know, pull them into a bunch and cut it off with a knife. Um, but that's a relatively good way to do it. Um, big fat asparagus, asparagus like this, I peel the bottom side of it because um, that skin can be a little bit fibrous. It also makes it look nice. Um, one time, many years ago, um, I don't know, I don't remember how long, maybe 15 years ago, um, I was doing a, a stage. Um, so, so the asparagus, you know, the tips are pretty, but I find that the stalks actually have um, much better flavor. They're generally sweeter, more um, asparagus flavor in them. So I actually prefer the stock part of the asparagus to the tip, even, the, even though the tips are pretty. But I remember I was working at this restaurant, I'm doing a stage at this restaurant from a, uh, in, in London, um, restaurant run by a shouty British chef. Um, and one of the dishes there, I saw that, you know, I saw one of the cooks prepping asparagus and they were taking um, the top inch of the asparagus, um, which is what, what goes on the dish. And then they were throwing the rest of the asparagus into the trash. And I was like, don't we get to use that? Like, what, like, aren't you going to use that for something? And they're like, no, like we, we only use the tips because it's the best part. Like, first of all, I disagree that it's the best part, but also it's like, why would you not save the stocks for, for family meal or whatever? You know, anyhow, this was 15 years ago. Maybe they don't do that anymore. Maybe, uh, Maybe maybe they weren't supposed to be doing that in the first place, and the and the cook and the prep cook was just doing it because they wanted to get their job done, which definitely happens. Um, so, you know, take that story with a grain of salt. But I was I was shocked shocked that they did that. Um, shocked in the way that we're going to shock these fava beans. All right, so we're gonna fish these fava beans out. I got a little bowl of ice water here. Um, I just stuck the inside of a salad spinner in that bowl to keep the the, uh, the vegetables away from the ice. So blanch your, vet, blanch, your, blanch your green vegetables, drop them into ice water to stop the cooking. Uh, and now I'm gonna get my, actually get my pasta in there. You can use whatever dried pasta you want. I, I generally, for pasta prima vera, I like sort of smaller, um, smaller pasta, you know, smaller, thicker textured pasta. This is um, Cresta de Gajo, so it's like shaped like um, rooster coxcombs. You know, ro rooster heads. Um, it's got like a little pipe with ridges on it, and then like a little ruffle around the back. I, I really like this pasta because it's um, it's a nice nice size, nice texture, really good at absorbing sauce. That's going to take about eight to ten minutes to cook, which means that's how much time we have left to um, finish prepping our vegetables and get them into that water in the right order. All right, so my asparagus, I'm just cutting it into uh, bite-sized pieces like that. Um, the the first vegetable that actually has to go into that water is carrots. So I got these nice little spring carrots. Little teeny tiny carrots in the spring tend to be, you know, more intense in flavor and a little sweeter than your, you know, your root cellar carrots, the winter carrots that are huge and are good for making stock or whatever, mirepoix. Got this nice red carrot, nice orange carrot. Um, when I cut my carrots for this, I like to do what I call a faux tourne or like a quarter roll turn. So you cut it once at an angle like that, and you give it a quarter turn, and you cut it again, and it forms these nice, cute little pieces that are not regular, um, but they have multiple sides, and um, what's nice about this is that you're not sort of restricted by the size of the carrot, so even if you've got a big fat carrot, you can cut off pieces that are all roughly the same size and same shape, you see? So like the, the other carrot was much bigger than that first carrot, but just by adjusting the width at which I cut, 
um, I can get pieces that are roughly the same size and shape, um, as opposed to if you're sort of relying on, you know, cutting, say, crosswise, whereas when you do that, when you just cut straight across, um, the size of the carrot pieces will be defined by the diameter um, of the carrot. All right, so these are gonna go in with the pasta. Fava beans can come out. I don't know why I didn't just do it that way. All right. So this is once once they're blanched, um, this, the peels kind of slip right off. And if you want to be real pedantic about this, you can take off that little germ also. Uh, you know, if I if I was a prep cook at a fancy restaurant, I would do that. At home, I'm not going to. In fact, these are this is a lot of fava beans for this particular dish. I'm probably not even going to use all these. Um, but I'll do just a bunch to show you how they work. Um, this recipe, by the way, it's based on one that I wrote for Serious Eats. Um, you, so you, I'll, I'll link in the description below, which in turn was sort of roughly inspired by one that um, Melissa Clark did for the New York Times. Um, so traditionally, um, this dish you would make a sort of pink... Uh, pink sauce with fresh tomatoes and heavy cream, um, and that was uh, Parmesan cheese and garlic, and that's sort of the base of the uh, of the pasta primavera. Um, I find so first of all, tomatoes are not a very springy vegetable. You know, tomatoes are a, a summer summer vegetable, so I, I don't I don't like the way tomatoes kind of dominate the flavor of the spring vegetables in this. Um, so. I cut out the tomatoes. I don't use them. Um, the other ingredient in here, in sort of traditional pasta primavera, is a sort of relatively heavy cream sauce. Um, I also don't like the way that uh, heavy cream sauces cover up the flavor of fresh vegetables. So instead of using cream, I do what um, Melissa Clark suggested in the New York Times, which was I use creme fraiche. Um, and I find that has a much lighter, more pleasing flavor. All right, that's enough fava beans for now. I'll save the rest of save the rest of these guys for later. Um, all right, so I've also got some string beans. Um, these are actually I don't know haricot vert French 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 beans. I'm just gonna cut the these little tips off, and then I'm gonna cut them into rough bite-sized pieces. Check out how our, all right. So you can see the pine nuts are beginning to toast. It's getting a really nice warm garlicky scent here. Absolute lowest heat. So barely any flame on there. What did I do with my spider? Here we go. This pasta I think is gonna take about eight minutes. close to done I'd say it's got about three or four minutes left um, all right so the last so I got my peas my the last green vegetable I'm gonna do is these snap peas um, I've already gone ahead and pulled off all the strings so you kind of just pull them like that and whatever string comes off that's the bit that's gonna be um, stringy and inedible um, so whatever doesn't come off you can just leave uh, and then these I like to cut into cut crosswise on a bias again into little bite-sized pieces. So the, the idea here is that you want everything to be roughly the same size and to be roughly the size of the pasta pieces. If they're big like that, you can cut them into two pieces. Mm, I love fresh Spring snap peas. All right, pasta has about a minute left. Green peas are gonna be the first thing to go in. If I was using um, frozen peas, I wouldn't add them until the very end, but regular fresh green peas take, um, you know, about three minutes, two minutes, two to three minutes to uh, cook through. Um, so those are gonna go in first. I'm 
I'm gonna tear, I'm gonna chop up some garlic while I'm at it. Uh, sorry, some basil. These stems I'll save uh, for a mix them into a tomato sauce later. Simmer them, simmer them with tomatoes to make a you know, like pizza sauce or pasta sauce. Very rough chop on the basil. You don't have to use basil for this. Um, you could use parsley, you could use chives, you could use tarragon. Any of those would be good. All right, so the peas have been cooking for maybe 30, 45 seconds, adding in my green beans, adding in my snap peas, and adding in my asparagus. I could have stuck these all in the same bowl since they're all going into the pot at the same time, so. Don't, don't yell at me for wasting, uh, for using an extra bowl. All right, creme fraiche. We're getting near the end. I love this dish because everything just cooks in one pot, nice and easy. Let's see how that pasta is doing. Great, almost al dente. All right, so at this stage, when the pasta is, and the vegetables are like 30 seconds away from being finished, put them all into the garlic and pine nut and butter mixture with whatever water is clinging to them, but that's good. You want some of that pasta water in there because that pasta water is what's going to sort of help thicken up, you know, the starchiness from the pasta water is gonna help thicken up that sauce and make it cling to the pasta. Let's swap these out. Put this one on the more powerful burner here. All right, stick it on the high burner. And now we're just gonna finish this off. Got creme fraiche, how much is that? That's eight ounces, so I probably put like six ounces of creme fraiche in there. Plenty of Parmesan. This is how you would finish virtually any pasta dish. Not all, of course, but many, many, any any dish where you, pasta dish where you're finishing it off with the um, with the sauce. You would do it in a separate pan with the pasta water. Um, that's just how you do pasta. It's how you how you get the pasta water to stick. How you get the um, the sauce to stick. Black pepper, and finally some lemon zest. Just enough to give it a little hint of that lemony flavor. All right. Shabu, come here. Shabu. How about that? All right, so you can see the sauce is a little bit sort of liquidy right now, and that's fine. As this pasta, as this, um, um, as it reduces on this high heat, we're gonna simmer it as hard as we can, and you're gonna see it's going to start to sort of thicken up, um, and the longer you simmer it and the longer you reduce it, the more that starchy pasta water is, you know, the more, the more water is going to evaporate off, um, and the more that pasta water is going to thicken up, uh, and the richer and thicker the sauce is going to get. So we're going to basically do this until it completely coats the vegetables in a nice creamy sauce as opposed to sort of the soupy sauce. It'll take about a minute. Pasta Primavera, pretty different from the, um, the Olive Garden version. Not that there's anything wrong with the Olive Garden. I don't know, is there? I don't want to, I don't want to crap on anyone, especially people who like the Olive Garden or people who work at the Olive Garden. Nothing but respect for anyone who works in a restaurant. All right, we can see it's starting to thicken up and coat things here. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have to add salt because the um, 
the pasta water was well seasoned, so that means all the vegetables should be well seasoned. Um, and plus there's pasta water in this sauce, so that's gonna season the sauce. So we really should not have to add any uh, extra salt in here at the end, although always taste, and if, if it needs it, add more salt. All right, so here we are. So you can see it's turning into a nice creamy sauce as opposed to a real liquid sauce. And that's exactly what we want. I'd say we're just about done. Okay. We're just gonna add in this basil. Add our, our herbage. Lunch in, lunch in two minutes. Take it off the heat. Ooh, this bowl is way too small for this bowl. It's all right. We'll fit as much as we can. Get some of those nice vegetables on top for the uh, for the pretty photo. Right, pasta primavera, spring pasta. Gorgeous. Hmm, real good. Just take a quick photo thumbnail and we are good to go. Hey guys, lunch is ready. All right. Hmm. Shabu. Oh, sorry, a little hot. Pasta Primavera. Here you go, hold on. <laughs> Oops, okay. All right, guys, gals, non-binary pals, I will see you next time, bye-bye. Hey everyone, it's Kenji. There are 22 million kids in this country that rely on school lunches for nutritious meals. And with schools closed now more than ever, organizations like No Kid Hungry can use their support. So I'm asking you to join me. Uh, click the link in the description below to donate some money. No amount is too small or too big. Thank you very much and stay safe, bye-bye.